Welcome to this program and thanks for joining us. Improving outcomes in small cell lung cancer through optimal integration of the latest therapies, expert perspectives on the state of the science, best practices, multidisciplinary care, and future directions. I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Carl Gay, an assistant professor in the Department of Thoracic Head and Neck Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Dr. Jacob Sands, physician at Dana Faber Cancer Institute, an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School. I'm Tafiko Wanikoko, Division Chief Hematology Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. So here is the agenda. This is going to be candid conversations around clinical management of small cell lung cancer, how we align our practice with the latest evidence and guidelines on current therapies to improve outcomes for our patients. In the second part, led by Dr. Sands, we're going to hear about managing patients with relapse disease. And finally, at the end of the session, uh, Dr. Gay will come in to talk about emerging treatment strategies to propel small cell management and outcomes for them. So to get us started, how do we align our practice with the latest evidence and guidelines? I will take us through some background, current gaps in our understanding of small cell and opportunities for improvement. As we all know, small cell lung cancer is a very unique diagnosis that pathologists make. It's a standard diagnosis under the microscope with small appearing cells, majority of which will express TTF1, 75% of these will have neuroendocrine differentiation, uh, there are some specific markers, synaptophysin, chromogranin, and CD56 that helps. But as we hear later on from Dr. Gay, actually some subset of small cells may not have these unique markers, and this will have therapeutic relevance in the future. <clears throat> small cell lung cancer has a very high mitotic rate and is a transcriptionally active cancer. Some of the agents we'll be talking about today are actually transcriptionally active. Historically, we've all viewed small cell as a very, very small uh, disease with very limited progress in our management of this condition. For the past four decades, we relied on just chemotherapy, mostly platinum and etoposide combination. This is a well-tolerated chemotherapy, and I think, as we can all uh, imagine, most oncologists are very, very familiar with this regimen. Why the disease is very, very responsive, majority of patients will respond. The main challenge that we face, and Dr. Sand will be taking us through that, is what do we do for patients when they stop responding and progress? Median progression-free survival with relapse disease is currently measured in months, three to four months at most. So there are barriers that we've all recognized treatment advances in small cell lung cancer. Not to belabor the point, but these are just some highlights. It's one of the most prevalent smoking-related conditions. Therefore, a lot of our patients also carry smoking-related cancer uh, morbidities. The disease is very, very rapid, and the clinical cause does not lend itself to waiting. Standard chemotherapy is very easy to administer, so it's very easy for people to just want to move forward and give chemotherapy without waiting for additional exploration of the biology of the disease. And this has resulted in a limited understanding of the biology of this disease and scanty amount of tumor specimens being available for translational work. The consequence of this has been plagued with failed randomized trials over and over again without significant extension in patient survival. And particularly in the second line and beyond, this is an area of uh, interest for translational researchers. After many years of no significant progress, however, I think we are beginning to see some, li uh, some uh, light at the end of the tunnel, especially in the frontline setting with the addition of immunotherapy to chemotherapy, and uh, some promising agents also in the second line uh, setting. So to take us through this, uh, I'll quickly present a case to highlight what we all struggle with in the, in the clinic, and I will invite my colleagues to in, uh, interject and contribute to the discussion as we move forward. A typical patient, 65-year-old, with past medical history of hypertension, COPD, and hyperlipidemia, heavy smoker, 45-pack year smoking history, went to the PCP complaining of persistent cough for more than three months, associated weight loss and fatigue, still with good performance status of ECOG of 1. 
PCP obtained a chest X-ray, which showed a left upper lobe opacity. Follow-up CT confirmed a 4 centimeter left upper lobe mass and associated left hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. Classic situation that we face in the clinic. Further uh, workup for the patient showed anemia with hemoglobin of 8 and thrombocytopenia with platelet count of 67,000. Biopsy was obtained via bronchoscopy and this confirmed the diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. Full staging with MRI was negative in the brain. PET CT showed additional disease in the liver as well as extensive bone marrow uptake consistent with skeletal metastasis that possibly explained the cytopenias. Patient has now been sent by the PCP to the oncologist. And we'll come back to this case later, and I would invite my colleagues then to weigh in on how best to go ahead and manage this so-called classic patient that we see in the clinic. So how do we manage patient newly diagnosed with small cell, especially with extensive stage disease, as the case I just illustrated? We've now moved away from using standard chemotherapy for our patient. As we've seen, while it is effective, it is not durable benefit. The Empower 133 was one of the earliest uh, trial of immunotherapy and chemotherapy, where patients newly diagnosed were randomized to receive chemotherapy along with placebo or chemotherapy with atezolizumab. Here, carboplatin was the platinum agent that was used, and patient on the atezolizumab arm continued with atezolizumab maintenance. Patients remain on treatment until progression of disease or loss of clinical benefit. This study had co-primary endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival. Additional endpoints include overall response rate, duration of response, as well as safety of this regimen. We are all familiar with this curve. Uh, this is just to remind us that adding atezolizumab to chemotherapy, carboplatin-based platinum double chemotherapy resulted in better outcome for patients in terms of overall survival, hazard ratio of 0.76. So we at least were able to reduce the risk of death in this patient by about a quarter. Uh, people can just look at the median and say it's modest. We, while it is modest, it is impactful. This is something that we've not been able to achieve for three decades. Caspian study design was similar, but I just highlight a few differences. Uh, this study also took treatment-naive patients, allowed those with asymptomatic, untreated brain metastasis to come on the study. It also allowed the use of cisplatin along with carboplatin as platinum uh, back, backbone. In addition, this study tested the use of two immunotherapy agents, <coughs> duvalumab and tremelimumab along with platinum doublet, or duvalumab along with platinum doublet and compared this to platinum doublet chemotherapy without placebo control. The Valumab was continued as maintenance in both arms with the immunotherapy component. PCI was not allowed for those patients on the experimental arm. It was optional for patients who received platinum chemotherapy alone. Again, primary endpoint here was overall survival with key secondary endpoint as listed on your slide. Similar to the Empower 133, Caspian uh, trial also showed that the addition of duvalumab to chemotherapy improved survival for patients compared to treating them with chemotherapy alone. Again, the hazard ratio here is 0.71, and this is actually much more mature data. At three years, this benefit persisted, uh, showing us that having our patient receive immunotherapy along with chemotherapy should be our standard, and we should only hold off on using immunotherapy in the front line if there is overwhelming evidence that this is going to harm the patient. Now, we still face the challenge that we do not know who these patients are. We see that tail of the curve, but we don't know who those patients are, and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Gay later on as to some efforts in the field to help identify these patients so that we don't have to treat all of these patients with chemoimmunotherapy if they are less likely to benefit. So with these two trials, we now have FDA approval for addition of atezolizumab to chemotherapy based on the Cas in the Power 133 trial showing improved overall survival. Additionally, addition of duvalumab to chemotherapy has also become a standard of care option for us uh, based on the Caspian trial. Please note that the addition of tremelimumab to duvalumab and chemotherapy did not meet the pre-specified endpoint and also resulted in increased toxicity. So this regimen remains experimental at this point and will not be recommended as standard approach. 
At this year's ASCO, we also saw another international phase three study that used a different antibody uh, construct. And this is important. This is an anti-PD-1 agent because everybody has been wondering whether anti-PD-1 would be effective since atizolizumab and duvalumab are both anti-PDL1. A similar design, saplulimab was added to carboplatin etoposide compared to carboplatin etoposide and placebo with key primary endpoint of overall survival, PFS, ORR, and DOR as secondary endpoint. This was mainly enrolled in China, but it's actually an international study, so it's not a China-specific trial. And here is the result of this study, showing that adding saplulimab to chemotherapy, similar to what we've seen with the anti-PD-1, also resulted in better outcome for patients. Hazard ratio uh, was significant, P less than 0.01, and as you see here, the median overall survival of 15.4 months versus 10.9 months. I want to point out here not to go and uh, make the conclusion that maybe anti-PD-1 is better than anti-PDL when just looking at the median numbers. I think this is just patient selection and we have to be very careful about cross-track comparison. But what we can at least conclude from here is that whether you use anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1, the benefit of adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy is a viable and uh, important strategy for us to continue to offer our patients. When we use immunotherapy, we should also be aware that we can, we're looking for benefit, but we should not lose sight of patient developing toxicity. Uh, I think a lot of us now as oncologists, we are very familiar with immune-related adverse events. Just to remind all of us that this requires us being aware of what we are looking for, anticipating it, and when it happens to detect it early, optimal treatment being offered to patient, and when we control the adverse event to continue to monitor and figure out a way to prevent it uh, recurring. And what you see here is the adverse event related to immune uh, activation can affect any organ in the body, from the brain all the way to the skin. And it's very important for us to actually elicit some of these symptoms from patient because at times some of our patients might just come to the symptom of immune-related toxicity like hypothyroidism to the disease itself. And it would be good for us to anticipate, monitor, detect, and then treat. So coming back to our case, I would now invite my colleagues to join me uh, in this patient that I just highlighted. Um, standard risk patient, I would say. Um, Jacob, how will you go about this patient. Yeah, I think the one thing that's not standard per se is the uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia. Certainly we see it. It's not to say that it's so uncommon. And then the big question is, what is that from? Now, in the, in the case here, we see that there's a lot of bone metastases. I think probably we're kind of getting at the idea of uh, a cancer-related uh, marrow replacement type of a scenario, in which case I would expect as the disease is treated with a response to therapy, which usually happens very quickly, that after that initial nadir, we would see counts actually recover quite higher. That being said, of course, you know, there are some details that maybe we don't have here. And if that's something that I don't expect to recover, then that becomes a much more uh, important aspect of the discussion of how to manage the case. So we can come back to that. Uh, you know, starting out, um, this is somebody in the outpatient setting, it seems, and so getting exactly what you described, I mean, whether that be the inclusion of atezolizumab or dervalumab, I think both of those are pretty well entrenched at this point, uh, and practices probably tend to use more one or the other, but I think of them both as being fairly comparable. Um, really encouraging to see that longer term, uh, the, the longer term results that you just showed from dervalumab, uh, essentially highlighting the fact that when we see these really excellent, durable responders, that that is something that may in fact really continue much further. You know, one of the things I say is that, that I mean, there may be people, and this is kind of, I feel uncomfortable even saying this, but there may be people cured of their incurable diagnosis. And we just don't know. Um, 10 years from now, we'll know, are there any patients that end up going more than a decade of uh, disease control? But I certainly have a few of them that are now really multiple years in. So very important to include that. If they were inpatient, then I don't, I think generally people don't give that with cycle one. Um, I, I, I sidestepped the myelosuppression, although I'm happy to come back to that. I, I, uh, 
And Carl, uh, would anything about this patient make you favor one regimen over another? So the, the only bit of nuance that I think I would add to what Jacob said is that occasionally when, when a patient presents with these cytopenias, I agree, this sounds like myelothesis and something that would likely recover with treatment rather than get worse. But I will occasionally hedge towards cis rather than carbo in that yeah. setting because carbo is a bit more myeloablative. Um, it makes me feel better. It may not, there's no data to back that up necessarily, but it makes me feel like I'm d putting some thought into it. Yeah. And the other thing, I know you're going to talk about this much, much later on uh, in terms of the imaging molecular diagnostics. Yeah. Um, are we seeing anything in terms of marrow replacement features and what we can find in blood? Yes, yeah, so, so, so absolutely. I mean, you know, the small cell in general has a huge burden of, of uh, circulating tumor cells, circulating free DNA. Um, that can be used diagnostically. One would assume that someone that had such a systemic disease like this would be a, a, a candidate right for that sort of detection when we get to those assays when they're ready for prime time. Great, great discussion. So let's move on. So this patient, as uh, rightly uh, stated, was treated with chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, one could have chosen duvalumab or atezolizumab along with chemotherapy here, but I think in recognition of uh, what uh, Dr. Gay mentioned, the cytopenia perhaps influenced the use of the Valuma because of ability to use cisplatin, since that trial allowed both cisplatin and uh, carboplatin. And despite that, patients still experience some delays in initiating cycle three and cycle four of the induction chemoimmunotherapy, but successfully afterwards transition to the Valuma maintenance. Routine staging of, uh, after five cycles of maintenance, the Valuma, unfortunately, show that the patient is now progressing with new lesions in the bone. ECOG performance status remains well preserved and patient is still you know, asking to explore other therapeutic options, uh, which I think is not unusual for a patient when they are feeling good, feeling well, and uh, they don't want to give up. And that is where we have to be there for them to support them because patients get a lot of information, especially when they go to Dr. Google, uh, they might advise them not to do anything and say, you know, a small cell, nothing is going to work, just give it up. Uh, I think this is really where we have to be the advocate for our patient. So Jacob, when you have a patient like this, and I'm, we're going to come back to this later, um, what's your approach in terms of setting expectations for patient for salvage therapy after they progress? Yeah, so in this case, it looks like we're probably talking about a five month uh, chemotherapy free interval. And so that's just important as far as categorizing where patients are uh, or, or therefore prognosis. Um, that being said, there are options. And you know, I, I have multiple patients that come in to see me as this Hail Mary effort, essentially coming in saying, I've been told that there's nothing, but I just want to make sure. And in some cases, there really are multiple other options. And I, I, you know, it's tough. I think the field has moved so fast. And that's not to say we don't have dramatically more to do. We do. I mean, outcomes still are nowhere close to what I would consider okay. But that doesn't mean that there's not anything. And um, multiple months of quality life are still multiple months of quality life. And, and when we string some of those together and then there's a trial that ends up working well, I mean, especially when you add in the possibilities of clinical trials, this is meaningful. <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to discuss multiple second line therapies. And that's actually a good segue into that, that I'll hand over to you to walk okay. us through your approach to second line therapy. So I'll answer that way in depth now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is good. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, so, you know, starting out, I think just historically what we've seen is platinum doublet was uh, the second line therapy. And frankly, back previously, there really wasn't something else. And so when you could treat someone again was kind of the next uh, was, was really the only thing to offer is when you could go back to the drugs that worked. And so platinum doublet rechallenge was something that was established. Uh, now in the US that has historically been a six month chemotherapy free interval is where that would really be considered. Uh, in Europe, it's more of a three month chemotherapy free interval. And so this was a trial that, that did come out of Europe, uh, looking at platinum doublet rechallenge versus topo -tecan. Patients could enroll to this trial um, uh, in the eligibility if they had at least a three-month chemotherapy-free interval. Uh, the majority or many patients had somewhere around that four to six-month uh, chemotherapy-free interval. Uh, and what we see is a separation of the pro progression-free survival curves compared to topo but really the overall survival curves are still 
quite overlapping. Now, Topotecan has really been the longest standing second line FDA approved option. And this came from two different trials. The one on the left is the PO version, so a pill that they take uh, days one to five of a 21 day cycle. And on the right is the IV form. And so the, at first it was the IV that was FDA approved. And you can see that pretty overlapping curves compared to CAV. So as far as efficacy, really not, uh, not significantly different. Um, was a bit better tolerated than CAV, and this led to an FDA approval. On the left side, the PO version uh, was actually compared to best supportive care. And I'd point out that I believe this is the only, um, uh, the only superiority uh, study that we, you know, the only study where we've demonstrated superiority in the second line setting. Topotecan has been a really hard one to compare to, and in fact, when Topotecan was compared to another regimen, they actually overlapped at that time too, which really highlights the challenge of second line therapy and the resistance that we see in the disease at that state. On the left side, uh, the PO version is FDA approved for a 45 day chemotherapy free interval, and on the right, it's a 60 day just based upon how those trials were done. The toxicities, and you know, this is the list. We don't need to dive into too much of this. I'd say certainly cytopenias, uh, the PO version, not surprisingly, has GI toxicities as well, fatigue. And then the IV, you know, coming in five days in a row, uh, which in some centers is feasible. In some of the bigger centers, like where we are, we are drawing in patients that drive a bit of a distance in many cases, and so that becomes less feasible in those cases. Now, lurbanectidin is, uh, um, you know, I used to say a newly approved. I, I suppose this is still newly approved in that it hasn't been many years, uh, but, it, but it has been a couple at this point, I believe. Um, and, and, um, uh, Lurbanectidin uh, is, uh, we have uh, small cell lung cancer is a transcriptionally active disease and Lurbanectidin mechanism of action is essentially to halt that oncogenic transcription, therefore leading to apoptosis. It, it also has an impact on the tumor microenvironment with tumor associated macrophages uh, and um, essentially causing apoptosis of these uh, of tumor associated macrophages, which on the first hand we say, well, these are immune cells, why is that a good thing? But these cells tend to uh, release um, uh, uh, inflammatory markers and um, uh, uh, VEGF. And so by uh, causing apoptosis of those, you're essentially preventing more of that tumor and microenvironment and inflammatory markers, which those in itself uh, may be something that stimulates the disease. So uh, a few different mechanisms of action uh, for the drug. Now, as far as the efficacy, I mean, we're going to go through this, and, and I will say I don't think that the medians alone are something to celebrate in this. This is not a home run. This doesn't solve the field. We can't shut the labs down. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. But, but for patients, I think this adds a meaningful uh, option. So on the left side, you see all patients. In the middle is that chemotherapy-free interval of less than 90 days. So these are really the most challenging scenarios where the disease tends to be very resistant uh, and, uh, and unfortunately lifespans tend to be very short. And on the right side is the chemotherapy-free interval of greater than or equal to 90 days. Um, so you know, 90 days isn't that prolonged six months that we, that, that we tend to use as far as chemotherapy-free interval, uh, but does provide kind of a nice cut as far as the, the prognosis of the groups. Um, you'll see that in the chemotherapy interval of less than 90 days, the median progression-free survival of being 2.6 months, as I said, is, this is not a headline to celebrate. But, you know, when you look further down in the six-month progression-free survival, 19% of patients, that's a lot of people being left behind. But for that 19% to get more than uh, six months of progression-free survival is particularly meaningful in this very difficult and resistant uh, disease scenario. In the greater than 90 days, we do see 44% of those patients with a median progression-free survival of 4.6 months. And I think what, we're what I'm kind of highlighting is the fact that this is not something that's providing an extraordinary benefit to more than half of patients getting it. But there are subgroups within that population that really are meaningfully benefiting from the drug. It's not enough in itself, but it is a good, a good option to provide. The overall survival is there as well. And here's the swimmer's plot and then the look at sensitive versus resistant disease. And uh, don't be enticed too much by the shapes of the curves in comparison. You'll see that the scale is a bit different. Uh, but, but with resistant disease, really, uh, of course, uh, we saw in the chart before, the prognosis is worse for that situation, and we see that in this as well. In the swimmer's plot, you know, we do see some patients with really meaningful uh, durability in their responses there, the lighter blue being that 
chemotherapy for interval of less than 90 days. So not surprisingly, we don't have many uh, uh, further up on that, um, uh, on that plot, but, uh, but, but this gives you a sense of, of duration. As far as toxicity, this was generally a very well-tolerated drug. The big thing being neutropenia. Patients were not allowed prophylaxis with GCSF, and so we do see about 46% of patients with a grade three or four neutropenia, although only 5% of patients had neutropenic fever. Something certainly to consider when treating in the clinic uh, as far as discretion, whether to use GCSF for certain patients. I'll also highlight, though, the 7% grade three fatigue. And when I first saw this data, I thought, well, patients with small cell lung cancer, maybe the disease itself is causing this. But in my experience, I certainly have had some patients that really had fatigue that I would certainly uh, put uh, uh, due to lurbinectin. And in one case, I actually couldn't treat the guy any further. He had very aggressive, rapidly progressive disease that responded very well to the drug, but had such fatigue, I just could not continue it. And even holding the drug, um, he had four months of ongoing disease control. So he was off the drug for an additional four months after we stopped it, uh, at which point his, his disease again grew extremely rapidly. There was no subtlety to whether the disease was growing in his case. And unfortunately, after that point, it was resistant to everything. Um, now, as far as myelosuppression or myeloprotection, in this case with trilocyclib, this is a new drug. Um, and we're gonna discuss this data uh, a little bit. Um, trilocyclib essentially did not show improvement in the disease-related outcomes, but did show improvement in quality of life, and, and particularly related to uh, cytopenias. And so that's, that's really what we're going to focus on. These were three different uh, studies. And you can see, uh, looking at, uh, again, cytopenia is, a, is really the focus of what we're going to discuss. It's not about the small cell. But you can see that here in the pooled data, um, severe neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia, we see uh, substantial decreases in the amount of uh, each of those when patients are pre-treated with trilocyclib before uh, each dose of chemotherapy. And so this is approved in um, platinum atoposide and topotecan. Both of those have FDA approval. I'll point out that platinum atoposide, that's three days in a row, and the trilocyclib is given before each day of chemotherapy. So all three days, not just at the beginning of the cycle. Now, in here, they point out their, their primary endpoint being severe neutropenia, and so really a focus on the neutropenia in particular. The control arm was not allowed to get GCSF. So I'll point out that, uh, to me, this is not a comparison to what had been the best standard of care before that, and I think we need to uh, um, understand that. That being said, the anemia and thrombocytopenia is not something we've had a good uh, a protective drug for up to this point, and I think that's where I'll focus some of my uh, narrative ar around that. Um, but here, here's something that I think often gets lost, uh, at least in the academic discussion of outcomes. We probably don't do a good enough job of really looking specifically at quali quality of life metrics. Those can be harder to characterize. And so we tend to look at the median progression-free survival and overall survival and the curves and whatnot. But to see um, a, a quality of life chart like this where everything is in favor of giving a drug, even without the improved overall survival and such, I think that's something to really take, uh, take seriously. And so here we're seeing fatigue, functional well-being, physical well-being, anemia, each of those, uh, and then of course the, the total. Now, um, I've mentioned that um, there are, uh, so here, here are some of the adverse events. Um, I don't think there's anything here that is really overwhelming, you know, we're talking about um, an injection site discomfort, uh, essentially. Uh, there was no grade three or four or, or phlebitis in 0.5%. So, you know, there's some irritation at the site, yet improvement in quality of life metrics. So um, I, I don't think there's anything here that, uh, that I'd find concerning. I did find it interesting that alopecia was actually uh, less patients. Um, uh, uh, when giving trilocyclib, so maybe it's somewhat protective in that setting. You know, this, this is something, let's see, um, this is something that I tend to use particularly when I have concerns about anemia and thrombocytopenia. If I'm worried about someone having neutropenia or being at risk for neutropenic fever, um, I, I'm not sure how to differentiate GCSF from trilocyclib, and I think that's worth uh, a debate. 
the, the study itself really focused on that, but did not allow for the best standard of care in that setting. So it's kind of like running a, a trial versus best support of care without allowing the, the best standard of care option. So I don't think uh, I have some criticisms essentially about that outcome being the focus, but for anemia and thrombocytopenia, uh, I have actually have found it to be very helpful, particularly in individuals that have had prolonged cytopenia uh, for each of those. Now we'll go a bit quickly through the, the rest, but I do think these are important to highlight. You know, the NCCN guidelines in the second line setting has this long list and I don't know, I've never used bendamustine. It's on there. I don't know if my colleagues up here have used bendamustine. So there are a lot of drugs on that list, and I don't think they all need to be highlighted, though. And so I'm going to point out the ones that I think are worthy of highlighting. And frankly, there are very few patients that really get through all of these lines of therapy and still qualify for a next-line option. That being said, there's not a ton of data because it is older. So arenatecan has been around for a long time. I think people have a lot of experience with, with arenatecan, usually in other settings, uh, such as colorectal, not necessarily in uh, small cell lung cancer. But this is a drug I, I use often. This is what we use rather than topotecan. Uh, the toxicities of topotecan and the five-day dosing, I think, are a limitation, and arenatecan uh, is, um, is an alternative to that. Um, generally well tolerated, you know, this is only 15 patients uh, with a 47% response rate, which sounds amazing, but again, with very few patients, um, and five of those were initially diagnosed as limited stage disease. That being said, the median duration of response is still reported in days, and the overall survival of 187 days, although this is really from a different era. At the time that this trial was done, it was just a very different setting. Paclitaxel is a drug uh, that I also commonly use can be dosed as every three weeks or the weekly dosing. I tend to use the weekly dosing just because it generally is very well tolerated for patients. And so um, I think in both arenatecan and paclitaxel, I certainly have patients that I would say have had meaningful responses to that and generally with, with pretty low toxicity. Temozolomide, um, I highlight because of the CNS control. This has very good CNS penetration and of course is used for brain cancers as well. Um, there are two different ways of, the, of doing the dosing, and this is really the way that it was initially uh, studied at the 75 milligram per meter square per day for three weeks on and then one week off. And you can see the waterfall plot there. Um, obviously, there are a lot of people still having progression. So again, this is not something that really is a solve for everyone. And in fact, uh, by my perspective, this is something that is less likely to be effective. But if someone has brain-specific problems, even though the response rates are lower, the likelihood of having an impact in the brain is higher. And that sometimes is a, a challenging thing to uh, explain in clinic, but, um, uh, but that is where I would, I would use it. I'm going to kind of skip those curves just because of, uh, I've, I've essentially described them. So this is the uh, NCCN guidelines recommendations. Uh, oh. Uh, this is the NCCN guidelines recommendations. Um, the other things that we did not discuss, but kind of go back to Dr. Iwanakoko's uh, description about PDL1 and PD1, is that, you know previously in the third line setting, Pembro and Nevo both had accelerated uh, approvals that the companies have pulled those based on negative trials since then, along with the establishment of both Derva and Tezo. But I don't think that's to say that they that they didn't have benefit. Uh, we saw Pembro in the third line setting when you combine their trials, a 19% response, response rate, but 13% of those with ongoing disease control at two years. And so the medians, I just don't think, are the right thing to, to look at in these immunotherapy drugs. You have a smaller subset of patients that are really benefiting, but the patients that do benefit, benefit extraordinarily. And so I have patients in the second line, third line setting that I gave Pembro with more than two years of ongoing control. And for them, I think that's been more meaningful than any other drug they could have gotten. It's just that the likelihood of that response is, is much lower than some of these other drugs. And so it's something to consider if I have someone with low volume disease that was initially diagnosed with limited stage disease and therefore never got a checkpoint inhibitor, it is still something I think about where to potentially fit that in when we're not really pushed to needing an immediate response and that can be the challenge. Back to our uh, patient, now that the patient has progressed and we've heard all of our options for salvage therapy, um, the patient was initiated on lobinectidine, of course, as would be expected based on the profile of that drug, grade 4 neutropenia was observed. 
This was uh, managed by holding the uh, treatment for some time and then restarted again at a reduced dose. After four cycles of labinectin, patients showed new brain metastasis and new liver metastasis. Still with very good performance status and patient is still uh, asking for more options. So actually before we move away from this case and maybe talk about what option would we have for this patient and Dr. Gay will take us through that. There's actually been some questions that came in uh, online from the participant. And one is, since we, dis we already informed the audience that the patient was treated with lobinectidine, the question that came up is, does it make sense to use tralacyclib with lobinectidine? You know, I was, so it's an off-label question. Uh, it's approved for plat platinum atoposide and for topotecan. That's not to say that those are the only settings that I think the drug would be effective for. Um, so, you know, I think that's something you could push in the scenario where you have concerns. Now, with grade four neutropenia, I would just give them GCSF. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a patient I'm treating right now, actually, who's first line uh, getting cisatoposide, um, uh, who uh, will refuse all blood products for religious reasons. She won't accept any blood products. And so that's somebody that I'm giving trilocyclib, uh, really in, in concerned about that. For neutropenia, I would just give GCSF. But if it were anemia, thrombocytopenia, I don't want to drop the lurbinectidin dose unless really forced to do so. Um, we saw the negative trial of doxorubicin plus lurbinectidin, although uh, the, the curves look really overlapping with CAV topotecan. Um, the dose of lurbinectidin was a bit lower in that study. Um, I'm trying to not dive too off the rails in answering your question, but part of that is that I don't want to reduce the dose of lurbinectidin. It's something I think to consider. It's not approved in that setting, so then that's a discussion as far as getting approval for that. And the other question, maybe Dr. Gay can take that since you're going to be talking to us about what to do in situations like this. Uh, any role for immune checkpoint inhibitor in relapse setting? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Dr. Sands touched on this a bit. Uh, certainly in patients that have had, had an original diagnosis of limited stage small cell lung cancer and did not receive an immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor in the frontline setting, I think at some point every small cell patient, barring some sort of obvious contraindication, should receive an immune checkpoint inhibitor. If they've had a long platinum-free interval, you can try retreatment with platinum and add the immuno immunotherapy there. Um, but if it's a scenario where they're clearly platinum refractory, I think it's worthwhile to, to try to push the insurer on, on, on approving either Pembro or Nevo single agent, or even the IPI-Nevo combination, um, you know, we, we will sometimes use, which at one point was in the NCCN guidelines and has also been retracted. So I, I think there's absolutely a role in the relapse setting for the right patient. Yeah. And I think this is for the three of us to maybe chew a little bit on. What do we do for patient presenting with paraneoplastic syndrome? Uh, there is a question on, from the online audience about, you know, patient with Lambert Eaton myasthenia syndrome. What do we do? I think it, it depends on whether or not it's an endocrine perineoplastic syndrome or a conventional autoantibody mediated perineoplastic syndrome. If it's an endocrine one, you know, SIADH or what have you, you just treat the cancer and usually it, it gets better that the cells that are producing the hormone die. Um, for the autoantibody mediated ones, generally that's not the case. You usually have to treat that like a separate autoimmune disease in addition to treating the cancer, IVIG, plasmapheresis, et cetera. And that's a, that's a very, very challenging situation. And whether or not you use immunotherapy in that situation, I, I would be very, very gun shy about, about adding that into the mix, e even if the patient did recover from that, from that autoantibody mediated scenario. Yeah, that's my approach as well. For those with um, you know, antibody mediated, they already have activated immune system. So I don't think you get a lot more benefit for the activating the immune system. You're actually more likely to induce more problem. And as we know historically, those patients actually do not die from small cell. They die from the complication of the uh, autoimmune condition. Um, I think uh, just one last one to plug in before we transition. Uh, Dr. Sainz, there is a question here about do you ever check NGS before second or third line? So this is a really important question for a rare set of patients. So in the first line setting, if I meet someone and they do not have a smoking history but have a small cell lung cancer diagnosis, it is in the NCCN guidelines to do NGS testing or to do genomic testing, and that's important. You know, 
Cancer cells, by definition, are cells that are mutated. So we box them into neat categories, but these are mutated cells. That's not to say that they all fit those. And in someone who does not have a smoking history, to me, that just doesn't fit small cell lung cancer. Now, I have had patients where they did have actionable alterations that did respond to targeted therapy, and one of those ended up undergoing a rebiopsy for other reasons. And on that rebiopsy, pathology said, oh, this looks more like a large cell uh, um, a neuroendocrine. Uh, despite at the initial diagnosis, I went to our pathologists who are exceptional and said, this does not clinically fit small cell. And they said, it absolutely looks like small cell. The rebiopsy at another site at a time point down the line was large cell neuroendocrine. Uh, I think it just highlights that the, the little bit we're getting on a biopsy in the same way as if someone has squamous cell carcinoma and never smoked, that can be more of an adenosquamous spectrum. Uh, and we can find actionable alterations as well. So it's important to remember in small cell, if they never smoked, yes. In someone who has a significant smoking history, no. Okay. So let's continue uh, the discussion with this patient. And I will ask Dr. Gay, you know, this patient has now failed two lines of treatment, or two lines of treatment failed the patient. The patient did not fail the treatment. Uh, so what would we recommend for this patient and why? So if you can take us through emerging treatment options. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and so I, I think it's important for everyone to consider clinical trials as a, as, a, as a reasonable standard of care for small cell, particularly in the relapse setting, but, but pretty much in any setting. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of, the, some of the clinical trial strategies that are emerging now, as well as some of the biomarker strategies that are being used to personalize therapy, hopefully in the near future. Uh, so I think we are at, at the brink of sort of pu pushing up against the limits of what one-size-fits-all treatment can do for small cell lung cancer. That's not to say that there aren't blockbuster drugs on the horizon that will, that will suit everyone, but increasingly we appreciate, while maybe not at the genomic level, uh, there, the, the, where the heterogeneity is, is relatively minimized, but at the transcriptional or proteomic level, there's a fair amount of heterogeneity in small cell, and this may underlie uh, different vulnerabilities to some of the therapies that we have now and therapies that will be developed in the future. And a lot of this is based around the expression of, of three transcription factors in particular, ASCL1, NeuroD1, and pal 2 f 3 So there's been a really uh, a large emergence of data in the last three to four years, um, kind of trying to unify uh, exactly how, what the landscape at the transcriptional level of small cell lung cancer looks like. Um, and then recently, um, our group, along with others, have identified a, a, a fourth subtype that seems to be prone to immunotherapy response, an inflamed subtype that may be the patients that explain the tails of the curves we saw in some of the earlier slides. So this was really one of the first efforts to, again, unify uh, the, the, the heterogeneity, the intertumoral heterogeneity of small cell lung cancer um, in, into something that could eventually be developed into a biomarker-based assays. Um, and again, here you can see this, this uh, graphic probably oversimplifies things. It makes the cutoffs a little bit sharper between the various subtypes, uh, but I think it really hammers home the fact that there are, there are tumors that are clearly enriched for ASCL1, for NeuroD1, for PAL2F3. The YAP is a little bit controversial and may play a larger role in kind of these mixed histology tumors that have come up um, and in some of the relapse cases more so than in the treatment, uh, treatment naive setting, uh, but still bears mentioning. Uh, and a lot of the data has recently has suggested that these are not just, you know, sort of um, showy graphics suggesting that there's heterogeneity, but this actually influences the responses to some of the therapies that we're seeing. And in particular, this inflamed subset of tumors, uh, which may be rare, you know, 15 to 20 percent in most of the treatment naive data sets we're seeing, uh, again, may underlie a, a large proportion of the responses that we're seeing to immunotherapy in the front line. And this has subsequently been validated retrospectively, admittedly, in both the Empower 133 and Caspian data sets. Uh, which I'll, I'll highlight here. So there have been a couple of efforts to, to look back at the Empower 133 data. Uh, you saw the curves earlier. There's a small percentage of patients who are alive at two years and beyond, uh, not what we see in non-small cell lung cancer and in some of the other settings where immunotherapy has been a blockbuster, but clearly some patients are benefiting from this. And fortunately, a lot of the patients on this trial had, uh, had biopsies that were sufficient for RNA-seq, uh, and, and we were able to classify them into one of the four subtypes that, that we've developed, the A, N, P, and I subtypes. You can see here, this is a look at long-term survivors in this population. Um, and while there were long-term survivors uh, across the board, 
you know, in, in all of the subtypes. If you look at the eye subtype in particular, and at the arm, including atezolizumab, actually more of these patients were long-term survivors than not. So there's a greater proportion within this, this rare subset. Um, and we showed that, the, that this subset had a median overall survival of almost 19 months, whereas for the other three subtypes, you're looking at 10 months or less in the experimental arms. Uh, and the Caspian data, so they looked at this data two ways. They used both the YAP signature and the inflame signature, um, as well as the sort of standard A, N, and P approaches. Um, and again, this is the trial that led to Dravalumab's approval um, in the frontline setting. And here we saw largely the same thing, that, the, that, these, that this fourth group, this rare fourth group, uh, seems to be the one experiencing this, the, the, the majority of the benefit from immunotherapy. Um, and it's not that these patients are doing better overall in the control settings, right? So if you look at the control arms on the right, it does not seem to be a prognostic marker. These seem to be predictive markers. Uh, and I think it calls into question whether giving immunotherapy to all of the patients is the right thing to do. I think that there's sufficient data, again, the long-term survivor data suggests that maybe our biomarkers aren't quite capturing everyone. So I think right now, we're still at a setting where we give it to everyone because we don't have a better alternative, uh, but it at least makes us think that maybe immunotherapy is a building block for some of these other subtypes that are not experiencing uh, a maximal benefit, but we need something else to help to inflame them, to make them appear more like this, in, this inflamed subset so that they can actually respond to immunotherapy. Small cell is an unusual tumor in that regard, and that it has a very high tumor mutational burden, but is largely an immune desert. Uh, and so T cell infiltration, immune checkpoint expression, interferon gene signature expression, really, really deficient in the majority of small cell, and probably explains why a tumor that would otherwise be expected to be immunogenic is not really responding to immune checkpoint blockade. And again, this is just uh, another look at the Caspian data. Here they used the, the, the previously published T-cell inflamed signature, which is just another way of identifying these so-called inflamed patients. So here you're looking at interferon signatures uh, and seeing again, the overall survival benefit is, is largely restricted to these patients with the high, high inflamed signature. So there are probably a number of ways to get at this patient population when it comes to biomarker assays. None of them are likely to be simple. It's not gonna be as easy as you know, a single gene mutation that you can detect on a liquid biopsy, but I do think it's worth pushing forward and seeing if we can identify these patients so that we can route these patients to the correct therapies. And in fact, just, just last week, right, AstraZeneca announced a, a major effort around moving forward in, in small cell lung cancer in a personalized fashion, utilizing these transcriptional subtype-based approaches. And so I think that this is something that in the near future you're going to see more and more of, um, and hopefully less and less of all comers, one size fits all approaches. You know, beyond the subtypes, uh, there are a number of other efforts in small cell. Um, some of them are, in, include kind of hammering down on exactly where immunotherapy um, fits into the small cell uh, paradigm overall. Um, so this includes, you know, the standard uh, sort of standard approach of consolidative thoracic radiation obviously was developed in the pre-immunotherapy era. Um, so this NRG LU007 study is trying to determine whether or not consolidative thoracic radiation or consolidative radiation in general still makes sense in the immunotherapy era with the tezolizumab. There are a number of studies uh, listed here that are looking to see whether the addition of immunotherapy offers a survival uh, benefit in patients that have limited stage small cell lung cancer where it's not currently approved. Uh, but in general, I think the goal is to try to kind of bring the immune system to small cell lung cancer, at least to those tumors where it's not already attracted. And a couple of ways that, 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 that various um, uh, trials underway are attempting to do that. So one is, I think, a, a unique target. It's a ganglioside target. This is fucosal GM1. So we don't generally think of targeting things that are not proteins. Um, and as a result, we have less data on kind of the heterogeneity uh, in the expression of this. But suffice it to say that this ganglioside is highly expressed across small cell lung cancer and some other high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. And so that, it, it, so, so they, they've, they've created a hu humanized antibody um, against this ganglioside which theoretically can help to bring some antibody-dependent uh, death to these cancer cells, um, as well as some cell-mediated cell, cell uh, immunotoxicity to these cancer cells. And so there's a cur currently a frontline trial combining this, this novel agent with nivolumab as an immune checkpoint inhibitor, again, to try to, try to uh, usher in more of the immune cell 
uh, population there with T cells in combination with the standard platinum etoposide, um, and then comparing that to a, to a second arm with, with, without the, uh, the, the novel agent. So it would be very interesting to see uh, you know, what, what targeting such a, such a unique uh, molecule brings. I think the, the idea of personalized therapy for small cell lung cancer or biomarker-driven therapy extends beyond the subtypes that I mentioned earlier as well. So this is a trial, SWOG 1929, that just recently completed enrollment, data not, not yet available. Uh, but this is using a biomarker called Schlafen 11. Um, Schlafen 11 has been shown in a number of studies to predict sensitivity to platinum and PARP inhibitors. Um, and so what this trial did was really focused on the maintenance setting uh, where atezolizumab was already approved at the time and patients' archival tissue was tested by immunohistochemistry for Schlafen 11 expression. If they were positive, they were able to be randomized to either atezolizumab or atezolizumab plus the PARP inhibitor talazoparib. Um, and almost 100 patients have now been randomized on this study. And like I said, the, the data should, should be out soon, whether or not this adds anything into this specific population. This would really be one of the first prospective biomarker um, studies in, in small cell lung cancer. And so if, if nothing else, is a proof of principle. Liposomal irina tecan is, a, is, is an option that, that had, some, had some momentum for a while. I think those, those in the know will, will, will recognize that we're, we're just a few weeks out from a press release suggesting that the, uh, that the resilient trial did not meet its primary endpoint of overall survival. Um, that's not to say that the drug is dead overall. Clearly, there's a, there's a role, as, as Dr. Sands mentioned, for arena tecan. Um, and so exactly where this might fit in future studies, I think, remains to, to, remains to be seen. Uh, they did not see any, any issues with safety or tolerability that suggest that that was the, the limiting step. And then something I want to take a few minutes to focus on is, again, this, this concept of bringing the immune system to small cell lung cancer, right? If the immune system is not making it in there on its own, sometimes you have to force the issue. And there are a couple of ways that, that we've successfully done this in other liquid and solid tumors, including bispecific molecules like bi bites, um, as, well as, uh, as well as CARs. Um, and so probably the, uh, the, 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 the most developed of these is tarlatamab, or AMG757. Um, and so this is a, a bispecific T cell engager targeting delta-like ligand 3, which is an inhibitory notch ligand that is widely expressed in small cell lung cancer and high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, um, as well as a few other types of cancer. And thankfully, not all that widely expressed in normal tissues. And so what a bispecific T cell engager does, right, is it has, it has an antibody that attracts it to the, uh, the, the, the target, in this case DLL3, and then another one that, that, that shuttles T cells along for the ride and kind of forces them to interact with one another. So this is re a recent update given at World Lung just last month in Vienna. And I want to highlight a couple of things. So this is from the, the phase one study. This was a number of different doses that were, um, that, that, that were tested here, for, you know, first and foremost, to evaluate safety. Um, but there were some efficacy data presented. Um, and so I think the overall or the objective response rate uh, is maybe a little bit misleading from the tarlatamab data that we've seen so far because a lot of these patients were treated with very low, low doses. And it's been shown that at the higher doses, the response rates were higher. But the duration of response here that was shown of 13 months, uh, given the data you've seen, especially from Dr. Sands in the relapse setting, right, these are heavily pretreated patients. That's an unheard of number for these patients to not to even survive for 13 months, much, much, much less respond for that time. And the overall survival in the entire population was more than a year, again, 13 months. And so that's including patients that are not necessarily responding. So they saw a number of patients that were having some anti-tumor effect without meeting resist criteria for response. And then other, also notably, the, the rate of cytokine release syndrome was actually quite low here. Most of it was very mild, grade one or two, very little in the way of grade three and above uh, CRS. And so this is something that while right now is being used primarily in the inpatient setting, perhaps has the ability to be used in the outpatient setting so it could be used widely in the community. Um, and so this is being now assessed in, in at least two studies, um, one of which is intended to be a registrational study in the third line setting is monotherapy. It's also being tested in combination with a, with, with a novel anti-PD-1. And so I, I think this is something that has a lot of us pretty excited. Uh, you know, we're really one of the first targeted therapy attempts in, in, in small, cell, small cell lung cancer. Um, and DLL3, I think, leaves kind of a bad taste in everybody's mouth because of the, the history with Roba T, but the issue may have been not the target, but, the, but actually the, the payload in, the, in that case, or at least the approach. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll end on uh, returning to the, to, to, to the discussion of lurbinectidin. Uh, and so I think 
there's a lot of interesting studies ongoing about exactly what lerbidectin's role will be moving forward in, in small cell. So one of those is, is, is this straightforward lagoon study, which is really trying to hammer down and validate that, that lerbidectin has you know, is, is appropriate for its established role in the relapse setting. Um, and so, uh, and so I, I think it'll be you know, interesting to, 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 to see this. I think all of us have anecdotal experience with patients responding to lerbinectin in, in the clinic. Dr. Sands had an you know, extraordinary anecdote that he, he shared. And so I, I think all of us are, are, are hopeful that we'll, we'll continue to have this option in the relapse setting uh, moving forward. But that's not the only, the only effort around lerbinectidin. So the Inforte study, uh, which is actually trying to move lerbinectidin into the maintenance setting. I think these maintenance trials are a really interesting approach for small cell lung cancer because many of these patients will have nearly complete responses to therapy that we simply can't consolidate, right? 90 plus percent reduction in overall tumor burden. And so it seems like if we could add something into the mix there that didn't offer the same toxicity as platinum or didn't offer overlapping resistance as platinum um, and really, really reduce the, 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 the tumor volume that, that's left, that microscopic tumor volume, you could really transform the outcomes of these small cell patients. So I'm excited about this and, and, and a number of other maintenance studies that are ongoing. Um, so I think that, that brings us to the, I guess, back around to the case and any other questions that we've yeah. gotten. Yeah, thank you for that uh, interesting you know, um, insight into the emerging op opportunities in this space. Uh, we do have some, a few minutes for question and answer, and we still have some online questions that I will start with. Uh, the first one is um, asking about, in which patient do you consider six cycles of platinum doublet along with IO? I don't. I, I mean, I give four cycles. Um, I think, uh, you know, the question comes up sometimes with patients that I see for a second opinion that have come in and that's the plan and, you know, frankly, I think that if the patient has had two cycles of therapy and their scan looks magnificent and they've had no issues and then after four cycles the scan looks clearly much more magnificent and they've had no issues, I can understand wanting to give cycle five and six but I still question how much you're really adding by doing so, I just don't know that you're really adding much benefit at this point, giving cycle five and six to these patients and potentially impacting long-term uh, issues around cytotox uh, myelosuppression as they later on get other lines of therapy. If they have progression in two months and now they have gotten more drug, I just think the downside of it is probably more than the upside um, in certain select uncommon scenarios. I can understand uh, the thought process in that setting, but uh, it really I'd say the standard is four cycles plus immunotherapy, uh, particularly in the, in the way that it was done in the studies. Yeah, I, I want to go on the record as saying I, I, I practice the exact same way, and it's something that I run into, like Jacob said, yeah. a lot in, in referrals from the community, yeah. and it creates a lot of anxiety. And oh, was I not supposed to get those additional cycles? I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I think there are really diminishing returns there, yeah. and mostly you're setting that patient up not to be a good candidate either for relapse trials or mm -hmm. for standard of care relapse therapies by further ablating their, their bone marrow. Yeah. And somewhat related, I think scans really need to be done after every two cycles, yeah. and I sometimes in the community will see see uh, scans being done after three or even four cycles. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really think it needs to be done every two. Yeah, yeah, I, that's my practice pattern as well. And I think the fact that the Caspian trial allows six cycles of chemotherapy, double chemotherapy on the control arm probably introduces that mm -hmm. type of consideration for patients who have been treated with chemoimmunotherapy. But I agree with both of you. Four cycles of chemoimmunotherapy as induction is sufficient. Uh, we have time maybe for one more question. There's actually a very long question. I think it's a case presentation, but unfortunately it's cutting off. But if I just summarize what it is, it sounds like a patient was originally diagnosed with small cell based on bone metastasis, underwent surgery, then had recurrence, turned out to be non-small cell lung cancer with EGFR mutation, and then was then treated with uh, osimertinib, but progressed after two cycles uh, with pneumonitis. So what's your approach for small cell transformation from EGFR mutant? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, it, I, if, if someone has a good approach for those patients, I would love to hear it. Uh, that's unfortunately a patient population that does very poorly. Uh, I don't think without, even without the pneumonitis, osimertinib was probably not going to work in that, in that scenario after transformation occurs. I generally 
you know, if it's a patient who's been on osimertinib and then transforms, I will generally continue the osimertinib and add platinum etoposide to that combination because you don't know how homogeneous the transformation is, right? There may be some adeno left behind that's still EGFR mutated. But the, the entire discussion around mixed histology tumors or driver mutants, I've had KRAS G12C patients with small cell, I've had ALK fusion patients with small cell, and how to manage these and kind of the chemo-targeted immunotherapy era, I, I think, is a, is, a, is a real challenge. Yeah. And I think the other thing to emphasize there is not to use immunotherapy for, like you said, you want to keep osimertinib going in those patients, and we already know that there is inexorably high toxicity of IO plus osimertinib, so that's yeah. something to avoid. Which, and just to clear, is, doesn't mean that you never use it, it just yeah. means you're pushing it down, down the line, yeah. and that's yeah. kind of, if there's yeah. a scenario after multiple mm -hmm. lines where you're kind of running out of options, yeah. but that's still an option, you yeah. can consider that. That's right, because I mean, you, may, you, you make, I mean, these are patients that were initially not expected to respond yeah. to immunotherapy, right, an EGFR right. mutant patient yeah. anyway, but the transformation may to totally change their tumor yeah. immune microenvironment, yeah. and so I, I agree, I wouldn't exclude it entirely, just not concurrently, yeah. and I would try to have some sort of interval between it mm -hmm. if I could. Yeah. Well, I think we've come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.